today. This could be the most revolutionary show we have ever done. We've got breaking news about Alzheimer's disease, and this is what really excites me, how you might prevent it. Welcome to the inside of your brain. Imagine that these cables are your brain's nerves. These lights, they're your thoughts, your memories, they're your emotions. Everything that makes you, you. Now with Alzheimer's, something happens that cut these signals to your nerves. And without those signals, the brain goes dark. Today you'll see what turns off the light. The answer is something that you do every day. And it amazed me and doctors everywhere. We now know that the foods you eat might trigger Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's, the dreaded disease that robs more than five million Americans of their past, present, and future. Their families watch helplessly as they slip away. Secretly fearful, they're destined to suffer the same fate. But now, new research gives incredible new hope. Until recently, we knew this devastating form of dementia was the result of tangles and plaques in the brain. But we still did not know what caused the disease in the first place. That's all changing. Dr. Susan Delamonte, a renowned neuropathologist from Rhode Island Hospital, uncovered the crucial role diet actually plays in Alzheimer's with a critical, groundbreaking new discovery. And she's now calling the disease diabetes in the brain. It was totally by accident that I discovered that Alzheimer's was a brain form of diabetes. I was studying another disease that I thought was regulated by poor responses to insulin. And so to check it, I knocked out the insulin and the insulin receptors in the brain. Instead of getting the disease I was looking for, I found Alzheimer's. It was a revolutionary finding. But if Alzheimer's is a kind of diabetes, could something in our diet be causing it? Following up on a hunch, Dr. Delamonte zoned in on chemical preservatives found in the food we eat every day. They're called nitrosamines, and their effect on the brain was shocking. We found that it produced neurodegeneration that's similar to Alzheimer's disease, and that really sent chills up my spine because nitrosamines are in much of our processed foods. That was the scariest part of the whole thing because we could be causing these epidemics ourselves just by convenience processed foods. Has Dr. Delamonte uncovered the key to preventing and possibly reversing this devastating disease? The future of Alzheimer's may never be the same. Let me state this clearly. Having diabetes or prediabetes increases your risk of developing Alzheimer's. But here's the stunning news. Even if you don't have diabetes in the body, you could have it in the brain. And the foods that we eat every day may cause it. Dr. Suzanne Delamonte is the groundbreaking researcher who connected the dots and turned Alzheimer's research upside down in the process. Also joining us is Dr. Richard Cremona. As U.S. Surgeon General, he recognized Alzheimer's as the epidemic of the future. Dr. Del Monte, kudos, congratulations. And this, this was a massive advance in the research in Alzheimer's. Explain to everybody the difference between insulin problems in the brain, diabetes of the brain, and diabetes of the body. Well, diabetes can take place in any part of the body. We normally think about diabetes as having a high sugar in your blood. But diabetes means insulin resistance for most of us. It's called type 2 diabetes. That can occur in the body, muscle, fat, liver and brain. There's an overlap such that about 40% of people can have diabetes that involves the brain and the liver or the rest of the body. And then some people only have involvement of one of the organs. So Alzheimer's can exist by itself or it can be overlapped with diabetes. So if I can underscore this everybody, we now know, and I didn't know this until the show, that the brain makes insulin. And that chemicals from the foods that we eat every day, which we're going to talk about, can actually cut off that insulin, which affects these cables. It kills these cables. And without the insulin, when the brain dies, you end up having Alzheimer's. Let me show you what it looks like. So this is two images. We have a normal brain, a healthy brain, 
and we have an Alzheimer's brain. Notice the healthy brain is big and robust and full body. The Alzheimer's brain has these areas that are eaten out, like little moths got in there. And they're specifically eating out areas where our memory is located, or places where we make important executive decisions. It's a big, de big deal for me because I think Alzheimer's is not just our genes. And I've got, I'm looking at people in the audience right now who I know are scared about that. Because when you've lost a loved one to Alzheimer's, you think it's your genes. But it's not genetic by itself. It can't be. The rates of Alzheimer's have been increasing significantly since the 1970s in all age groups. Something else is going on. Dr. Cremona, put this in perspective for us. How important is this link of insulin to Alzheimer's? It's extraordinarily important. The research that Suzanne has done is you know, really groundbreaking. It's uh, opening up new doors for us so that we really start to understand how and why these things occur. So with the work that Suzanne has done and others have done, we start to see the environmental influences and what we can do to stay healthy. That's extraordinarily important. So Dr. Delamonte, is this insulin link that you've identified, the missing link that we've been searching for in our research in Alzheimer's, do you believe? I think so. Insulin is needed to make neurons grow, function. They make chemicals that make you move and feel and think. And without insulin, it's like a plant not having any water. We need insulin from the beginning. We need it to when we're old. And uh, without insulin, the brain won't function properly. So insulin resistance is like taking away the insulin that's needed for the brain to function. For most of my lifetime, uh, folks have focused on the plaques, believing that the plaques are what cause Alzheimer's disease. And this is the first time that most doctors will have ever heard about insulin being the major issue in the brain. You know, I went to the heart surgery because I recognized that I had solutions I could give people. I mean, there were action steps. And I was fearful of Alzheimer's because I didn't think we could do much. We were pretty limited until recently what we could do. What I love the most about the groundbreaking work you've done is that it changes all of that. It's a seismic shift, and all of a sudden, there become tantalizing bits of, of information that we can start to offer to folks that they might be able to take action of and change their chances of getting it. Dr. Kimona, are you, are you convinced that, uh, that we can prevent Alzheimer's by just what we eat? Do you think food can be that powerful? I think food can be very powerful, and, and you know, food is an essential part of the equation to improving our health status. We don't have all the ideas in front of us yet. There's still a unifying concept that's developing, how all of these dots get connected. Mm -hmm. But clearly, nutrition, appropriate eating is important. The fact that obesity is linked to type 2 diabetes, which can be linked to Alzheimer's because people who are overweight, people who have type 2 diabetes, have a higher incidence of Alzheimer's. Right. So you start to see the science is coming together and we're, we're connecting these dots with this great research. But it does tell us there are things that we can do to mitigate and possibly prevent these diseases. So let so me bring alive this link between what we're eating and Alzheimer's disease. So you're out there, you're the body, right? And you're all the chemicals that are in the body. Behind this barrier is the brain. The body has this magical place called the blood-brain barrier that prevents chemicals that are in the body and foods we eat and toxins that come into our lungs, et cetera, from getting through the barrier to the brain that's hidden behind it. Now, I am a toxic molecule. I've been created by the liver because you ate something you shouldn't have eaten. And I begin to tear at this. And eventually, I bust my way through. And once I've done this, what I've been able to create is a gap, a huge gap that allows toxic molecules to influence how insulin is made in the brain. Without the insulin growing those nerves, what happens? The nerve cells begin to die. So it might be we have found why we make these plaques in the brain. So let's talk about some action steps. What are the four food groups that Dr. Belmonte is most worried about that can cause or contribute to Alzheimer's? Again, this is cutting edge work. This is you know, new stuff that I'm still setting up on. But having done a lot of work on this with our medical unit, I'm convinced there's something here to talk to you about. The first group are the smoked meats. Bacon, smoked turkey, hams, things like that. Then there are the processed cheeses. I'm not talking about regular cheese, I'm talking about processed cheese, which have chemicals sometimes added to them. Then we've got beer, which I know is gonna surprise a lot of folks, and we'll come back to this. And then we have the white foods, white flour, white pasta, white rice. Now, you know how I feel about white foods. We've talked about them. The sugars in these foods bump up your insulin, it wreaks havoc metabolically, and it sends toxic chemicals to your brain to bust through that blood-brain barrier that I just showed you. So let's talk a little bit about smoked meats. Dr. Del Monte, explain why you think processed foods and smoked meats might be problematic for us. Well, because they contain nitrosamines or they contain chemicals that make your body make the nitrosamines. 
What these do is they cause the liver to metabolize these toxins and make lipids or fats that can cross the blood-brain barrier. Mm. These fats are toxic to the brain and they destroy the function of insulin in the brain. Mm -hmm. And as a consequence, we end up with a brain insulin resistance. Now, what are you gonna look for in the label? Here you have an opportunity because it's written there. The sodium nitrite goes into the stomach, gets digested, and, and the preservatives that are used to make these foods irritate the liver so it makes those toxic fats that Dr. Del Monte spoke to. So on the food label, let me just show you what this is gonna look like. Well, there'll be an ingredient list, and it's gonna say sodium nitrite in it. You wanna see that. Dr. Kamona, you know, someone spent his life educating our public about health issues. If you saw food with sodium nitrites in it, would you eat it, and would you recommend that folks act aggressively on this or cautiously? I think what has to happen now are what you've talked about for a long time. Look at those food labels. Start to understand what is in those foods. When you see nitrites, if you can stay away, as much as possible, stay away. Eat organically. Eat foods that are wholesome. Start making better choices in your life and getting healthy foods, just like we do at Canyon Ranch. Well, just to point to Dr. Del Monte's research, if you found food that had sodium nitrite in it, would you eat it? I would try and stay away from it. Okay, let's turn to beer now, because this shocked me. I mean, I can understand you know, the processed foods, but why is beer an issue? Because originally when beer was being processed, it contained nitrosamines and nitrites. And now most of the beer has been cleaned up and probably contains less of it, but some of them still do. So one has to be cautious in that some beers, especially processed beers, mm -hmm. might have these uh, toxic chemicals in it and might be equally damaging. But on a scale, one would put the processed meats and foods way above the beer. I put our medical unit to work trying to find out be which beers were the safe ones and which ones weren't. You know, you can't find out if nitrites are in beer. It's not released. It's, there's no ingredient list on it. So uh, it's going to be up to manufacturers to educate us, which I think might come about because of the, you know, this show and, and others who are not going to start focusing on the, the role of nitrites in, in this process. But it is something that we're going to have to pay attention to and start to tease out. Dr. Kamoto, you lead uh, the Brain Health Initiative at Canyon Ranch. Give us some big ideas about how you talk to your audiences about brain health, and specifically with regard to foods. Well, I think this whole area of neuroplasticity, that the brain can continue to remold itself throughout life, is very, very important. How is it that we're living longer than longer because of life expectancy increasing now to almost 80 years old? We want to make sure that our brain actually stays with us through all the physical changes in life and doesn't fall short. What can we do? staying physically active, eating healthy foods in the right amounts with the least amount of preservatives or no preservatives, being intellectually stimulated, reading, writing, do things differently. If you're right-handed, try writing with your left hand. Comb your hair with the other hand. Do things that you normally don't do. Stand on one foot. All of those things stimulate the brain to make new neural connections. The good news is with the information we have with the new science, dietary manipulation, we can make healthy decisions that will help to prevent lots of diseases. And what's good as far as the brain, the things that we do to stay physically, physically involved, eating healthy in the right amounts, never smoking, know your environment, read the food labels, they contribute to a lot of other areas of health like cardiovascular health as well. So it's a win-win all around. I want to thank you both very much. Again, congratulations. Fabulous work, well delivered, well articulated. It will change the way we all think about Alzheimer's. Thank you. When we come back,